over 200 years, there have been reports of giant, man-like creatures roaming the vast mountain regions of the Pacific Northwest and Canada. Hundreds of people have encountered these creatures the Indians call Sasquatch. In 1958, newspapers began to publish these stories in which the press called these creatures Bigfoot. And by the early 1960s, the first full-scale expeditions were underway. Bigfoot was attracting national attention and was now rapidly becoming the most intriguing mystery on the North American continent. The most significant find to date is the famous Roger Patterson film taken in 1967. Patterson searched for Sasquatch for years. On October 20th, 1967, near Bluff Creek in Northern California, he encountered the creature and took these 16 millimeter pictures. Scientists and photography experts have examined the individual frames of this film and have come to the conclusion that the film and the creature are authentic. The first pictures ever taken of a Sasquatch. This film gained international attention and with it came the most comprehensive research effort ever undertaken. Under the supervision of North American Wildlife Research Center, investigators began feeding data into computers. After months of computerized research on behavioral patterns, migratory movement, and eyewitness descriptions, the computer began answering the many questions surrounding these mysterious creatures. By programming information from hundreds of sightings, the computer drew us a picture of Bigfoot. It corresponded with the Patterson film. Researchers have believed that in some remote wilderness where man has never been, these creatures are living in complete solitude. The computers have now pinpointed this area, and here at North American Wildlife Research, we have organized and financed an expedition to search this unexplored area in hopes of capturing a Sasquatch. The final destination of this expedition is north of the river the Indians call the Peketo, in a primitive part of northern British Columbia. We are taking the latest and most sophisticated equipment, tranquilizer guns, electronic gear, and sniper scopes. If we capture a Sasquatch, we will implant a small transmitter and release the creature so that it can be traced by radio and studied scientifically. Deep in the heart of the vast wilderness of the Pacific Northwest and Canada, a legend extends back into the spoken history of the earliest Indian tribe. This legend is about the mysterious giant creatures that inhabit these forests. The description of these creatures by those who have seen them gives one the uneasy feeling that somewhere roaming free and wild in these deep, dark valleys is a living, breathing reminder of mankind's prehistoric past. This is the legend of the Sasquatch. Today, this legend continues to be told in the Northwest by many responsible people who have reported sightings and encounters with Bigfoot. Because man has never been able to capture a Sasquatch, this creature has become the world's most intriguing mystery. To these men, and to me, the Sasquatch is serious business. This is the beginning of one of the most extensive expeditions ever organized to search the rugged, uncharted country of British Columbia for Sasquatch. It is the hope of all of us on this expedition to prove once and for all that the Sasquatch legend is true. I'm Chuck Evans, the leader of this expedition. I'm the chief investigator for the North American Wildlife Research Center. The man I'm talking to is one of the most distinguished anthropologists in the world and my good friend, Dr. Paul Markham. He has done extensive research into the Bigfoot phenomena 
and he's now one of the leading authorities on Sasquatch. He has helped plan and outfit this expedition, and he's organized this base camp. We are now in the last phases of our preparations and hope to shove off sometime this morning. Hey! When did you get in? Uh, we got in yesterday. <laughs> Had quite a trip over those mountains. Hank Parshall is an Idaho rancher and one of the country's leading experts on tracking dogs. Because of his keen interest in Sasquatch, he has volunteered his horses, dogs, and time for this expedition. Hank first heard of Sasquatch when he was a small boy. And throughout his life, he's talked to many people who claim to have seen one. One of the most colorful characters of this expedition is Joshua Aloysius Bigsby. Josh has been a fixture around the Northwest since the turn of the century. He claims to be at least 80 years old, but no one knows for sure. <laughs> Not even Josh himself. He's probably the last of the mountain men. He knows every trail in these mountains. And so does his faithful mule, Zeb. Josh is important to this expedition because he is the only one who knows the way to the Pecato River. From there, Tekka Blackhawk will guide us. Mr. Evans, thank you. Your knowledge of the land beyond the Pecato River is crucial. It's a relief to have you here. Well, it's a pleasure to be on this trip. Have you had a chance to work the dogs? Tekka is a graduate from the University of British Columbia and comes from one of the largest Indian tribes in northern Canada. His Indian background and knowledge of the Sasquatch legends make him one of the most critical members of our expedition. And there's Barney Snipe. He's our camp cook. He's a crack shot with a rifle and an excellent woodsman. He's a little clumsy. But his coffee isn't bad. Get a hand over here. I'm Chuck Evans. Bob Vernon, National News Service. Has Dr. Markham gotten you squared away? Yes, and that horse Hank Parshall introduced me to kicked me in the knee two seconds after I met him. I'm glad it wasn't more serious. They tell me that you um, don't see the point of this expedition. That's right. I don't believe in Bigfoot. I'm here because I'm good at my job and the pay's good enough to make it all seem practical if not desirable. I'd much rather be back on the streets in New York City where the enemy is visible and real instead of chasing some mythological boogeyman in the woods. Can we see you over at Central Chuck? Be right there, Paul. Bob Vernon is a reporter for a major news service assigned to do a story on our expedition. Although he's a thorough skeptic, he is an honest writer. But his negative attitude disturbs me. Hank, are you about ready? As soon as Dr. Markham finishes packing his last piece of equipment, I'll be ready. Good, I'll go see if I can give him a hand. In the meantime, go ahead and line him up. Oh, can I give you a hand? No, thanks, Chuck. I've just about got it. Well, Hank is ready when you are. Okay, I'll be ready in a moment. Vernon, you about ready? Yeah, I'm ready. This wilderness we're going to can't possibly be as primitive as all these elaborate preparations make it seem. Well, just hang in there. You may be in for a few surprises. <laughs> Hey, Josh, move them out. Take it easy. Remember, we don't know this place as well as you do. By late morning, the pack train and animals were loaded, and we pulled out with old Josh leading the way. We are taking the best in equipment and supplies. And I feel especially pleased that Hank is bringing his finest tracking dogs. The dogs are German Shepherds, trained and selected specifically for this expedition. Unlike hounds, they track silent and will not bark or betray their presence until their quarry is cornered.
happy to be on our way. But as the chopper buzzed us a last goodbye, we realized that we were leaving our families and civilization behind. It will be weeks before we are resupplied by parachute. After the feverish activity of the last week, the first two or three days out into the wilderness seemed a welcome relief. The temperature was a mild 70 degrees in the soft air of early June. The skies were a deep Prussian blue. Everyone had the feeling of oneness with nature that comes to all who lose themselves in the Pacific Northwest. It was early summer in the high country, the best time of the year. nurses her pups until a nosy badger comes too close for comfort. Our expedition was scheduled to last until late fall, until we found the habitat of the elusive Sasquatch. We would search for months in this wilderness of British Columbia, checking the valleys, the mountains, and high country, crisscrossing the hundreds of square miles of trackless forest, seeking a trace of these legendary creatures of North America. We rode through this beautiful land of mountains and valleys for the first weeks, camping each night by some mountain stream. We were to pass many beautiful lakes and mountains and cross hundreds of streams. And later, well, later there would be a river to cross that none of us would ever forget.
by unspoken consent. The journey was quiet as we traveled through the forest. We did not want to advertise our presence. And it was quite an experience to watch the wildlife on every side as we plunged deeper and deeper into this primitive country. We had been climbing steadily since our departure. And everyone now enjoyed the magnificent scenery that lay in front of us. Well, Vernon, have you ever seen anything so beautiful? No. Never. I've hiked a lot of trails and climbed some spectacular peaks, but I've never seen anything like this. Hold it a minute, fellas. Look at here. What is it? Bring your binoculars. Hey, it's Smokey the Bear. Oh, it's a grizzly. It's the most ordinary animal there is. We have to put it on somebody up ahead, because it might double back on us. I thought cougars were more dangerous than bears. No, oh, a grizzly is the most dangerous and unpredictable animal there is. A cougar will never attack a man. Unless he's so darn old, he can't catch anything else. That bear doesn't look all that dangerous to me. Don't count on the way he looks from way up here. You know, a couple of old minor friends of mine were killed right now you're here by a grizzly. Well, Bob, are you getting yeah, pictures that picks, that you like? Yes, okay, you guys. This Cheese and salami on the last of the store bought bread. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That fricasseed mountain rat we had last night wasn't bad. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, you get mountain rat. <laughs> well, I bet worse. I remember back in Aughton Five when we was caught in the back country, not to eat except gopher. You ever at gopher, fellers? <laughs> well, it ain't the best in the world. Then again, they ain't the worst either. <laughs> and Josh ought to know. <laughs> Josh? How far do you figure it is to the Pecato? Well, at the rate we're going, I figure it'd take about three weeks, maybe four, unless we run across one of them critters. Hmm. How many sightings have there been in the area to the east of us, Paul? I've got four in 1966, nine in 1972. And to the north of us, there have been more than 20. How can you be sure there are Sasquatch in the area where we're going? Our computer readout shows there have been numerous sightings in the area north of the Pecato. That particular area of B.C. has been taboo for my tribe and others for as long as Indian history goes back. The early white explorers couldn't get anyone to guide them in. Take a look at this map. This area. All dense forest. Running east and west is the Pecato River. All around the perimeter we show various sightings of Sasquatch. How large would you estimate that population to be? Well, there's really no way to tell. We don't have enough information on how the Sasquatch lives. Josh, show us where we're headed. You see that third range of mountains over there? Yeah. Well, just behind that is the Pecato. And just beyond that is the land the Indians call Haya country, or Forbidden Land. You can't see those mountains from here, but they're there. And so is the critter. As we moved closer to the crest of the first range of mountains, we started to hit small patches of snow. I worried that our progress might be slowed by glaciers or large snow fields that we couldn't cross with horses. Josh assured me that we would skirt the dangerous areas.
They're just short and spooky for some reason. Oh, get out. I'll never badmouth you cooking again. Hey, Barney, where'd you ever learn how to shoot like that? That's an inheritance from my old grandpa. It's a darn good shot, Barney. It's too bad we had to kill him. He was a fine-looking animal. But with the taste of pack horse in his mouth, he'd have followed us. And he'd have got one of them eventually. What's the damage, Hank? Well, the horse is all right. Cat didn't cut him too bad. It's a good thing. We needed that pack horse. Well, we'll rest here for an hour. But we've got to be leaving. We've got to be to the next valley by tonight. See a Sasquatch? No, not exactly. What do you mean, not exactly? Well, I've seen a heap of tracks. Some big ones, some little ones. I remember back in 1912 when we was traveling up the Cumbria River way with a bunch of fellers doing a bit of hunting. We stopped to camp for the night. Well, during the night, something snuck into our camp and tore it all to shreds. Maybe it was a bear. Tore no bear. How do you know you didn't actually see it? Well, I seen the tracks the next morning. It's about 18 inches long. No bar has feet that big. But how many people have you talked to who have actually seen a Bigfoot? A couple dozen, maybe. Do you believe in that Mount St. Helens story? I sure do. I know old Fred Beck who told me about it. The way old Beck told it to me, he and three other fellers was working a mine back in 1924 called the Vanderwijk Mine. They'd been prospecting, pan a little gold up in the Lewis River country. This is near Mount St. Helens for going on six years. He's doing pretty well, too. 
They'd seen a lot of tracks around during the years, and they always just figured them to be tracks of a big engine that was still roaming the hills. On this ticketer day, one of them came back from town with a new assay. It was a dandy. They discovered a pretty good strike of gold, all things considered. They're all kind of excited. They decide to knock off for the day and celebrate their good fortune. They headed back for the cabin as usual, along an old, well-used trail. And hear the sounds of footsteps behind him, and off the sides too. Sure, follow them. they got back to the cabin, they were pretty scared. Charlie was more scared than the others. And the sounds of those footsteps, it seemed to him like there was more than one of them things out there, whatever it was. Decided they'd eat a quick supper and go to bed. They had heard nothing more from the trees, and they figured that whatever there was out there had gone away. for most of the night. Sometimes it was still, and other times it increased. <laughs> Luck kept crashing down, the cabin kept shaking, and they kept shooting. But they never knew if they hit one of them. Well, just before dawn, the attack stopped. All around the cabin were large footprints of critters. They was over 18 inches long. And there's a ton or two of rocks had been thrown down from the ledge. Fred said the apes had did everything they could to get into the cabin. It was built too solid. To this day, that canyon is called Ape Canyon.
Fred always did say to his apes, but the way he described them is a lot bigger than apes. That's some story, Josh. I've heard that same story from a whole lot of people up my way. It's always the same. I'm inclined to believe it's the gospel truth. Uh, we're going to have a guard tonight. You think we need one? <laughs> hey, don't worry, Bob. I'll set the dogs on both sides of the camp. If anything moves, they'll let us know. <laughs> Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> Each day on the trail brought a new experience. <laughs> Hank noticed that Ochako seemed nervous. A little later, he found out why. crested the second mountain range, I realized why Josh had been reluctant to bring outsiders into this spectacular country. It was obvious that this was a wilderness seen by few men and untouched by any of them. It gave us the feeling that we were visitors in a special land that belonged only to the animals. And I hoped it would be theirs forever. In the past weeks, we had crossed many ridges and valleys and spent much of our time on small detours along creek beds where the soft earth would reveal tracks. But we hadn't found a single track of the evasive Sasquatch. Now we were over 200 miles into the interior. Looking back over the country we came through, it seemed impossible that we had made such good time. It was the 4th of July, and we made camp early. The long, hard hours in the saddle made us appreciate any brief moment of relaxation we could find. But we didn't expect the celebration that was beginning to shape up on a nearby glacier. the last of the big mountains. From here on, it would be a long downhill ride into the canyons of the Pecato. Josh estimated about a week to reach the river. But it had been many years since he had traveled this country, and I had the feeling that, well, that he was not certain about what might lie between us and the river.
watching the grizzly fight reminded us how wild this country really was. We followed the game trails whenever we could. Some days we made good speed. Other days we were slowed by heavy timber. middle of July we reached the Pecato and across from the raging stream was Sasquatch country. There she is! I've got more four white men ever seen them before. Pretty hate it. Ever seen them before, Pecca? Before I was a young man. It was a lot further downstream. This is higher country. Many evil spirits dwell here. Can you guide us through that wilderness? I know the way. All my life I've known the way. It's been told around the campfires of my people for more generations than I remember. All know the way, but none go. Once we cross this river, we move with caution. Make camp back up in that meadow. Hank, will you look for a better crossing downstream? Tekka, take a look about. We searched the river for a better crossing site. The best place was just above camp. Tekka, I know that you've never been across the Pecato, but 
Is there anything at all in those Indian legends that might help us out? I'm afraid that these maps just don't cut it. Only that the land is more dense and rugged. My grandfather once told me the trees are taller and the meadow grass higher. There'll be no trails at all to follow. I take it the going will be slow and we'll have a hard time getting the horses through the brush. Let me see that map, Chuck, my boy. Look at this. Here we are. Now, if you's a Sasquatch living in these here parts, wouldn't you rather live down here where these valleys come together, where there's plenty of water and a lot of food? Yeah? Second. Most of the legends speak of a valley with three arms. That may well be it. Well, then, that's the way we'll go. We'll cross the river in the morning. We'll have to cross here. It's a doggone treacherous waterfall just downstream. So we'd better get an early start. I'll ask Barney to rustle us up a cold breakfast. I had tech to clean up the dogs tonight. They're a little restless. I think they got wind or something. You didn't see the herd of deer that come through this morning, did you? Well, I was awake at dawn, about eight or ten deer come through, about 20 feet away. Come on, Josh, the dogs would have picked up the smell on them deer. Nope. Them deer was too smart. They come downwind of the dogs and made nary a sound passing by. You fellas remind me of the story Hank was telling me about old Bauman back in 1850. <laughs> it was told by none other than Teddy Roosevelt, and he even wrote it down in his book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I can tell it <clears throat> like Josh could. Yeah, but he's right. It was told by Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy spent a lot of time in that wilderness and was a hard man to fool with a tall tale. And he said the story was told to him by an old weather-beaten hunter by the name of uh, Bauman, I think it was. Well, Bauman had to believe that story, because Teddy noted that every time he told it, he couldn't keep him shut Well, the whole thing happened back in 1850 when Bauman was a young man. Him and his partner was trapping up in the mountains in Idaho. And not having much luck trapping, Bauman and Jessup, not being superstitious men, decided to go up to a particular small stream that was said to have a lot of beaver. Now, but to get to that stream, they had to travel by way of a pass that well, it had an evil reputation ever since a year before when a hunter wandered into it and was killed by some wild beast. Well, Bauman and Jessup, calculating that they couldn't get the horses up the pass, traveled on foot till they reached a beaver swamp where they decided to camp for the night. still a few hours of daylight, so they built a small lean-to and went on up the creek with the traps. Now, setting the traps took a little longer than they thought, so they didn't get back to the camp till late in the evening. When they came into the camp, the whole place was just torn up. The lean-to was smashed. Blankets and supplies were just thrown all over the place. And all around the camp, there was footprints just as plain as if they'd been made in snow. And they examined the tracks real close and concluded that whatever it was certainly walked on two legs. Now, it was getting too dark to tell much. The two men went on to bed with the intentions of studying the tracks in the morning. About midnight, Bauman was awakened by some kind of noise. He saw a black shape come across the front of the lean to He grabbed his rifle and fired a shot at it could not see what it was. All he knew is that it was running fast. Well, after that, both of them sat by the fire the rest of the night, keeping a close watch for that doggone thing, whatever it was. That thing came back and stood for an hour or so on the trees across the swamp. And it made some god-awful sounds, but it didn't come near the camp. In the morning, they both decided to leave the valley just as soon as they could. So they spent the rest of the morning gathering the traps from the creek, and well, you know something? Every trap was just plumb empty. 
Yeah, by noon. And their fears of the past night just kind of damned. Even seemed a little bit foolish. So uh, since there was only three traps left, Bauman volunteered together, and while Jessup went on into camp to pack up the gear for the departure. <laughs> Turned to the camp. Everything was quiet. He hollered for Jessup. There was no answer. Then, Brown caught sight of his friend. He was dead. His neck broke, just like it had been nothing but a twig. Jessup was dead. There wasn't nothing Bowman could do but bury him. There wasn't time to do that before dark, so he just grabbed his pack and headed down the horses where they was hobbled, and he lit out of there just about as fast as a couple of scared horses could handle. Bowman said as far as he knew, them traps were still up there on the old Salmon River, along with Jessup's bones. Hank, you think that story is true? I guarantee, doggone to you, a man like Teddy Roosevelt wouldn't have said nothing that didn't believe him. There are lots of stories on record like that. Well, I hate to break this up, but I'm going to have to radio home base for some supplies. Uh, great. I got a list for you. And don't let them forget the Tabasco sauce. Anyone have anything else they need before I call? No. Oh, we'll okay. <laughs> Come out of there, you varmint. That ticker's all fit. Come on. Come out of there. You guys don't know your own place. Who do you think you are? Come on. Come on. Get out of there. You varmint, you? We suggest you approach. From the east, out of the sun, the wind is at five knots. Roger. It was good to see the airplane. The arrival of fresh supplies and letters from home lent a nice feeling to the day. It was comforting to know that we had a direct link with civilization. And there it is, mail from home. Yeah. We were now almost 300 miles into the interior. Just an hour and a half flight for the plane, but a good month's trek by horseback. <laughs> oh, my Tabasco sauce! <laughs> Later that morning, we attempted the river crossing. It was just as tough as we had thought. The rapid flow of the water and the depth of the stream made it extremely hazardous. Hank started across with the pack horses. Everything was going well until we hit midstream and then... sweeping horses and riders downstream.
Checa managed to throw Barney a rope, and we pulled him out of the river. morning we had all crossed the Pecato, dried out, and we're back on the trail. This country north of the river, it seemed different. Even Tekka remarked at the change. We noticed that the mornings were cooler, and the sunsets came earlier. The season was changing. This country held a unique fascination for all of us. It was obviously virgin wilderness. might catch sight of a Sasquatch at any time. This knowledge would keep us on the alert from now on. There was an abundance of game everywhere, more than I had ever seen before and none of the animals seemed afraid of us. Perhaps we were the first men and horses they had ever seen. We continued to travel this way for weeks, looking, searching, and watching. We examined every stream bed, checked the soft earth in the meadows. Whenever we'd see a likely looking meadow, we'd all spread out and look for tracks. When we crossed small streams, Hank would take the dogs and search until he was satisfied that there were no trails or tracks. Because research on Sasquatch has shown that part of their diet consists of plants, Paul Markham spent a lot of his time cataloging the different kinds of forest vegetation. And during the whole trip, I never saw him for long without his ever-present notebook. That's powerful. Yes. The going was slow and tough through heavy timber, many times with no trail at all. We began to wonder what had happened to the valleys we had spotted on the maps weeks earlier at the Pecato River. Some days we were hindered by brush so thick the Tekka had to cut a trail before the horses could move through. The fear of missing our destination was weighing heavily on us. Even some of the meadows were treacherous. My horse, Lava, became mired in a meadow bog. For three hours, we worked in the mud while the mosquitoes worked on us. Lava had given up, so I did the last thing I could think of to save his life. The whipping worked, and Lava made a final lunge and freed himself from the mud. If we had lost him, we would have had to redistribute the equipment and I wasn't looking forward to riding a pack horse. Strange things began to happen. Watch it! It was as if someone or something was trying to stop our progress. We began to worry. Were these attacks 
or simply a quirk of nature. There was no way to explain it. We were all feeling the strain of the long trip. And Bob Vernon was becoming more cantankerous as each day passed. The wilderness had not changed him as I had hoped. The horses are a little jumpy. I hobbled them instead of tying them up to a picket line. I think we need a guard. There's nothing to guard against around here except 300 pound mosquitoes. Well, then you ought to be able to hit one. Does that mean it's my turn? Vernon, that attitude of yours is going to get somebody killed. Um, Barney, get the first aid kit. Right. Hank, Tech, I'll make sure that grizzly's out of here. Bob, right. I'm going to move your arm. You tell me if it hurts, all right? Thank you. Uh, Set you up for them, Bob. Careful. Easy Let's get it off this side. Watch this arm here. Oh. Easy. Uh, easy with that. Okay. Josh, you got the gauze? Yeah, right here. Well, that ain't too bad. That old grizzly bar didn't hurt you too much. You'll have to take it easy for a spell now. <laughs> Whoop, careful. It's going to be a little sore. I think you'll live. Ah, good. The experience with the grizzly was pretty scary to all of us. And as Josh had warned us weeks earlier, the grizzly is the most dangerous of all big game. Vernon didn't talk much about it. His carelessness had just about cost him his life. And now he would have respect for the wilderness. On the morning of the 10th of September, we broke camp and rode as usual. By late morning, a new sensation seemed to engulf the expedition. An unknown presence of danger. It was a feeling of foreboding. The forest around us was vacant of life. The horses were also feeling it and were harder to handle. This uneasiness continued all day. That afternoon, we reached the first valley. After almost three months on the trail, we were now entering the area where the computers had told us a population of Sasquatch might exist. Would this be the place where we would find them? No modern expedition had ever encountered a Sasquatch, except for Roger Patterson's. Perhaps our effort would be for nothing.
we decided to camp at the edge of the meadow, near the head of the valley. You want some more beans? No, I no, no, no. Thanks. Hey, Barney, we were talking about how to capture a Sasquatch this morning. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought of a new way. Throw your biscuits at him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you just wait. That old Sasquatch, he's going to come wandering into this camp asking for some of my good cooking. Yeah. And you ain't even going to have your tranquilizer guns ready. <laughs> oh. Oh. Watch what you're doing. Nothing but an old owl up in the tree. <laughs> yeah, well, that could have been a Sasquatch. Oh. It's time you guys got to your lookout stations. Your poor old cook needs protection if he's going to be cooking these good meals and washing dishes. And doing all the necessities around this camp. Oh. <laughs> Barney. Barney's right. We'd better get ready. What if there are two or three or more? So much the better, Barney. That'll up our chances with the tranquilizer gun. Yeah, and our chances of getting killed. Oh, come on, Barney. Don't be such a coward. Being as big as he is, Sasquatch could break the back of a man with one blow. We've got to consider him smarter, and more dangerous than a grizzly bear. And I don't need to tell you about grizzlies. So don't take any chances. If he comes, he'll come from the thickest part of the forest. Sightings show he has a tendency to stay undercover. That'd be over by post four where Hank is. Right. Do you think he'll come alone? Perhaps. All right, you better move out. have is what the Indian legends speak of when Sasquatch is present in an area. This morning we entered the domain of Sasquatch.
make a check-in. I checked the force with a sniper scope. Couldn't see a thing. The Sasquatch was here, all right. I caught a smell on the wind. It's sort of rotten smelling. Okay. Keep the channel open. Hank? Yeah, I'm okay. What the heck was that scream? It had to be a Sasquatch. Nothing else sounds like that. If he gets close enough, put a tranquilizer in him. Don't you worry. Josh? Josh? Josh, answer me! Nothing. He must be back in the trees. Where's Josh? He's gone now, though. Gone? Just listen. The forest sounds are coming back. Well, the next time you go traipsing off, let someone know. We thought it might have got you. Nah, not a chance. Well, I think he'll hit the sack. He won't be back tonight. Most of us were rather tired and sleepy the next morning. Although Josh had slept like a baby, the rest of us sure hadn't. It had been a disturbing experience. At the first light of day, we began to cover the meadow to check for tracks. Those screams had been so close, we knew we should find some evidence of what had made them. Made this morning, look, the edge of the print is still sharp. After all this time. Here's the other impression. And they're about six feet apart. Sixteen and a half. Eight and a half at the ball. An inch and a half deep. Estimate the creature to weigh somewhere between eight and nine hundred pounds. He must have been standing right here, looking down on us last night. Here's another one! Come on. Let's get a cast made of this one. Barney, the resin kit. You bet! I'll see if I can pick up a trail with the dogs. We made one cast of each foot. We were using the new resin materials, which took longer to dry than plaster of Paris, but this substance is practically indestructible. We had finally found our first Bigfoot tracks. And Paul was more excited than I had ever seen him. There was no doubt in his mind now that Sasquatch was a living, breathing creature. Hank and the dogs followed the trail which led out of the meadow, through some trees and ended at the base of a steep rock cliff. It looked as if the Sasquatch had climbed right up over the top. 
it would be impossible for us to follow. Only experienced mountain climbers could get to the top and, and of course, the creature had crossed over by now. Vernon? Tekka pointed out that the cliff curved in the same direction we were headed. If the Sasquatch continued in a straight line, we might pick up his trail on the other side. We decided that Hank and Tekka would walk around with the dogs. We would break camp and meet them with the horses. Late that afternoon, wind had covered the tracks with dust and the first of the fall storms was approaching. For two days, we traveled in heavy rain and could only hope the rain would not turn to snow. stopped for lunch in the trees, but Tekka was never still. He roamed the edge of the meadow, looking and searching. Chuck! More tracks! It's the same pattern. See the resemblance in the print? The ball of the foot has this big lump on the side. It's the same creature. How old is the track? Two, maybe three hours old. Made this morning for sure. They're heading the same way we are. The dogs can take it from here once we're ready to go. We were back on the trail, and now there wasn't any question about the direction the creature was headed. If the Indian legends were correct, we were nearing the heart of Sasquatch country. The storm broke, and we were to enjoy a few warm days of Indian summer. We continued our journey with the ever-present feeling of uneasiness. Oh. In the next valley What's the was the most oh. awesome sight I had ever seen. Were you guys at the line pole? Yes. That's the way the Sasquatch marks the outer perimeter of his domain. It's incredible. Incredible. It is as the ancient ones have said. The Sasquatch are in the place of the three valleys. From here we go with danger. The broken trees at that height indicated a creature that could stand over 10 feet tall and weigh better than a thousand pounds. It was a frightening realization. The tremendous strength it would have taken to break those trees off so cleanly. And I think we all began to understand the danger we were in. There were no sounds of the forest. It was obvious to all of us that we were now in the heart of the Sasquatch domain. There were tracks everywhere in the soft earth of the meadow, of different sizes and moving in different directions. We reached the third valley. Here you could feel the presence of Sasquatch. We could catch a faint odor on the wind. The valley opened into a large meadow surrounded by dense forests, and a lake protected the north entrance. Tekka suggested we camp on a knoll above the meadow near the tree line. It was out of the swampy area, and we would have the lake on one side for protection. Now our chances for making a capture were better than ever. We had to be ready to take advantage of any opportunity. We set up camp and began rigging the electronic sensing device. It was developed by the research center as an alarm system to monitor creature movement in mountain country. Properly set, the console here at camp will tell us the location, speed, and direction of an approaching Sasquatch. While Josh and I strung the main wire from the console, Markham, Tekka, and Vernon began setting the perimeter wires on the other side of the lake. 
the inner perimeter was placed around the edge of the meadow. These wires are so fine, a Sasquatch will not know when he breaks one. The outer perimeter wire was placed 350 yards back in the trees, circling the meadow. These wires were attached to insulators five feet above the ground, high enough for normal animals to pass under, but low enough that a Sasquatch cannot avoid it. Using metal rods, we established gates throughout the perimeter so that when a section of wire is broken, we can pinpoint the creature's location on the console. There were eight gates in each perimeter. Paul, will you check me out in this again? This is our outer perimeter. We've set it about 300 yards back into the trees corresponds with this amber row of lights. This is our inner perimeter. It's about 50 yards away from the end of the meadow. Corresponds to this white row of lights. Anytime he moves through any one of these gates, corresponding light will go on. If he moves into the inner perimeter, he should be close enough for one of our men to get a shot at. And if they miss, and he keeps on moving, we'll be ready for him right here. Exactly. We are using the most potent tranquilizer known. Markham recommended we load the darts with twice the amount normally used for grizzly bears. These guns have a range of 70 yards and will be equipped with sniper scopes. The late afternoon was spent testing the trip gates and checking the guns. By dusk, we were ready. We ate a quiet dinner the thought of what could happen this night was on everyone's mind. We knew the Sasquatch might come, and with it our opportunity to capture the greatest anthropological find of all time. We wanted to make a capture, but if things got out of hand, we would have to protect ourselves. Hank, Tekka, and Vernon volunteered to take positions in the inner perimeter. The rest of us stayed to protect the camp. in your sector. He should be just beyond the edge of the tree line. Gotcha. Hank. Hank, he's moving. He's just broken gate three in sector two. He should be just beyond you, just to the left of you, in the trees.
crazy thing. Chuck, he's still circling the meadow. Creatures changed directions. He's moving in a semicircle towards the other end of the meadow. Second, there's another creature on your side. He's just broken gate eight. I can hear him moving. Just inside the line of trees. I can't see him. But I can hear him. The sound is coming from near gate seven. It is done. We can go home. And it was over. The Sasquatch didn't return. Our camp and equipment was smashed and ruined. We had several injuries. Barney had a vicious cut on his head. Markham's knee was shattered. And poor Bob Vernon was in shock. Could you pick up the trail? Yeah. It wasn't hard. Tanker was right. They done took on out of this area. There's a whole lot of tracks leading off to the west. They seem to be moving real fast. We'll never catch him now. It looks... like we're finished here.
Chuck talking. As soon as we get this mess packed up, we'll move out. Barney? A good cup of coffee. Our equipment was completely destroyed. With the injuries and the fact that winter was approaching, it was imperative that we head back. As we leave the valleys of the Sasquatch, the questions still remain. Are they a unique type of being, neither human nor animal? And how have they managed to exist until now, hidden from the view of man, deep in this wilderness of North America? We had found the habitat of the Sasquatch, our efforts will provide volumes of information to stimulate preparations for more extensive expeditions. And next spring, when the snows begin to melt in the high country and the Sasquatch return, we might be here too, in the forbidden valleys of the Bigfoot, tracking and studying mankind's greatest mystery. Maybe.